Hey everybody, um, doing a review today. I know I sound tired as hell right now, but um, partly because I am. It, it's been a long week and trying to fix a lot of things in my life, but that's not important right now. Well, it's important, but not for the purposes of this video. Um, a few quick announcements. Next week, I don't know if I'll be doing... Well, the next two reviews I'll be doing... I don't know which ones I'll be doing first. I don't know if it'll be Watch Dogs or Murdered. Chances are it'll be Murdered, but I want to keep my options open on this still. But what I'm going to do is do a review, week off, do a review, week off. One, for the sake of finances, I have some money saved up, but I want to make sure I keep on saving some money. And two, um... I want to kind of filter my reviews this year. I don't want to. I'd like to do them as often as I can, but until I either a get a second job or b win the lottery, which isn't going to happen, that's not going a uh, possibility. I have more important things to do with my finances, but that's not to say I can't budget for that, rent, and reviewing. Because I have some things I can do or do right now for that. I have three potential feet in the doors for three different jobs. So, and hopefully, fingers crossed on this, something might change at my current job where I might be able to get more hours. But I'm sincerely doubting that right now. But, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to do Murdered as the review before Watch Dogs, even though that comes out the week after Watch Dogs, or if I'm going to do Watch Dogs, mainly because there's been some serious hints lately about Watch Dogs not living up to the hype. I don't know how true these hints are, obviously, but I, that's one of the things I kind of want to filter through the reviews is not just making sure there's a game I like, but I want to do the one that interests me the most, and Murdered interests me a bit more than Watch Dogs right now. Square Enix doesn't have a good history with these games, and that's what concerns me, but it interests me more. So, with that said, on to the review of... Getting this out of the sunlight, and yes, it's backwards. And I'm going to say this flat out right now. It's very, very hard right now to do this review without spoiling some major points to this game. That points I think are major. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend the first part of this video talking about the review first reviews free spoiler spoiler free review and then i'm going to go okay if you don't want the spoiled or if you haven't played it yet stop the video here that being said this game took me by surprise i ironically there's a bit of a backstory behind it i i'm a fan of the wolfenstein series since wolfenstein 3d i liked return to castle wolfenstein i liked the 2009 Wolfenstein that came out, but when they said, oh, this one's in the 60s and it takes place after World War II and the Nazis won, I was like, what? Y you just completely retconned the entire series. How are you going to get past this? I should have been paying attention who made the to who made the game. See... Machine Games, a lot of the people who work for Machine Games did the Chronicles of Riddick series and the first Darkness game, which are less purely gameplay driven and a lot more story driven, and they have been some of my favorite games this past, you know, the PS3 360 generation. I didn't know they did this. And that should have been, if I knew that, that would have been my first clue that I should have known what I was walking into. 
and I should have been pleased. Um, but I reserved it after selling back a bunch of games that I wasn't playing. And Gemma and I are walking to the theater, we're going to see a movie, and she goes, hey, you know, Watch Dogs comes out the week after. I'm like, because I wanted to reserve that, and I didn't think of it. I thought Watch Dogs was coming out a lot later. And they're like, oh, oh well, if Wolfenstein's bad, I'll sell it back. I was expecting a middle-of-the-road game. Or a bad game, or something that wasn't this. And what I ended up with was um a game that has a lot of throwbacks and good ideas story wise gameplay wise entertainment wise and is probably one of the most well thought out interesting ridiculously fun first person shooters i have ever played it's definitely the first or best fps on the next gen slash current gen, gen um, consoles right now. And this is what really gets me is the biggest complaint I have is some of the odd difficulty spikes that happen later in the game. Normally, later in the game, yeah, it's going to get harder because of more enemies or big or bigger battles or more strong or more of the stronger enemies. Now the problem I had with this is when you're doing stealth parts, you can sneak up on say a super soldier that would t normally take about two rockets to kill. First one dies in one one hit, the second one takes five. And I don't know if that's a glitch or if there's just certain weak points. That might have been on me. But that was my biggest problem with this game, is the or the overpowered sh armored shotgun guys that take more damage than the super soldiers. And that one wasn't on me. That one is still bothering me. But I'm watching some of these other reviews, and you have people saying, Oh, the enemy AI is bad. They walk by dead fallen enemies like nothing's there. No, they don't. No, no, they don't. I don't know what game they were playing, but just yesterday, I killed a guy, or a Nazi, saw another one walking up. He didn't see me, or walking away. I didn't know if he was walking away or walking towards me, so I went and hid. Then, just before I started to head out to check to see where he was, he sees the body goes, someone's down, and starts going after me. Yeah, they don't ignore fallen comrades. I've had enemies flank me from areas I didn't know they could come from. Like, there's a closed door behind me. I'm getting shot from behind because they open or went around the uh, uh, other hallway and opened the door to sneak up on me. Yeah, the AI, it's not the greatest AI because sometimes they do just stand in front of you like, huh? Mostly on the stealth parts. I've had guys, though, I'm hiding behind something. They could just see the top of my head. They would go, what's that? And stare as they walk by, not raising the alarm. Just kind of look like, huh, I see hair. That's weird. Huh. But if you move, they spot you. Yeah, I mean... I don't know what this bad AI complaint people are talking about is, but it's not true. What is true on the bad side is as beautiful as the graphics can be, some of the textures are really, really bad. Um, really low resolution textures on some of these things. I first noticed it in one level where someone's helping you out of a trunk of a car and you see his hand and it just looks really bad in comparison to the rest of the textures on him it just it kind of pixelated and gross looking 
there's other areas where the water, when it's raining, is really pixelated and grainy. But it could be so much worse. It could be, say, Call of War as the Cartel, where they just don't texture three ro or parts of or three sides of a rock, and you can see through it. There are a lot of worse graphically intense games out there. I mean, you even have the occasional texture popping, but it's kind of like, eh, big deal. But, with the fun gameplay, gunplay and stealth, I hate stealth normally, except for, say, Dishonored. The stealth in this isn't Dishonored quality, but it's still a lot of fun. Um, the shooting is a lot of fun. You... <laughs> I go Rambo at points when I'm really pissed off at the game, and I just pull out two assault rifles and start shooting at everything, and for some reason it just increases the fun like tenfold. Um, or um, dual shotguns, and dual automated shotguns, and that's... Right then, that sounds ridiculous. You can, like in Halo and um, a few other games, you can dismount machine guns and take them with you so you're walking around with this 50 cal shooting things like you're fucking Rambo but um it, it, it's those moments where you're like okay this game's not meant to be realistic but it's meant to be fun and I'll get back to that in the spoiler part of this because there, there's a very big thing with that now, this big standout point, and this is what took me by, this, by surprise the most, is that this is a Wolfenstein game with a really, really well thought out, deep story. I mean, it doesn't just explore, hey, let's kill Nazis, it's... Let's explore the damage that war does to the human psyche, to, or what World War II was doing to the people who were trying to survive it. It explores love, it explores hate, vengeance. There's one character, guys, seriously, my favorite character in this game, Max Haas. The only two words he knows are Max Haas. Half of his or top of, or half of the top of his head is flat. He has severe brain damage, but he's very emotional. And he has a scene in the end of the game that, without spoiling it, it shows a lot of growth. Without, re, or it shows a lot of character growth on his part, and as well as another character's part. With only two words and one huge action. And it just impressed me. Because this mentally handicapped character like that is very hard to write properly to get an emotional connection from. Because a lot of people, unfortunately, they see that as, oh, it's comedic relief. And they took a character that could have easily been seen as comedic relief... I made him one of the most powerful characters in the game. Um, there's a part where people are like, "Oh, that it, that came out of nowhere." There's a sex scene right in the begin or towards the beginning of the game, where people are like, "That came out of nowhere." But you got to remember, it's kind of written like a Bond movie at points. It's a really odd mixture of a pulp, not our pulp World War II novel, a James Bond movie. And a really, really emotional, like, really, really emotional war slash survival movie. And it's an odd combination that somehow works. But what's really intriguing, there's two pathways you can go, while not all of the gameplay is different. You save one character, there are, one, bits of dialogue that are different, and two... Some of the level design does change. Now, my first playthrough, I saved the pilot in the prison, and I had to go down a tower with turrets shooting at me. But, 
if you save the other guy, that tower part's completely missing and you just ride an elevator down. So parts of the missions do change after the timeline shifts. You get different abilities and power-ups depending on the timeline. The pilot will give you health power-ups while the other guy will give you armor power-ups. And I thought that was a... It's, it keeps the game varied enough, but nowhere near as varied as the different changes on the levels, because that kind of gets you wondering, okay, what else has changed? The different dialogue options, the different themes that are explored, but what really got me is in the Chrysal Circle with the pilot, you get this crazy woman who life revolves around mathematics. With the other guy, you get Jimi Hendrix. And it changes dynamics a bit completely too that seems like a spoiler but that's pretty common knowledge that there's a Jimi hendrix not parody but type person in this game but there's certain things you have to do and there's this irrepressible connection or need to compare Wolfenstein to another id game. And I'm not talking about Doom. I'm talking about Rage. Ra I think Rage's problem was that it was too lofty for what it was. It wanted to be so many different things. It wanted to be a first-person shooter. It wanted to be a racing game. It wanted to be an RPG, or Borderlands slash Diablo type RPG. But it failed at all of them. The racing was clunky. The best thing you could say about Rage is that it got 60 frames per second with the Do or id Tech 5 engine. What Rage does wrong on the first person gameplay point of view, Wolfenstein does right. And what Rage did wrong on the story point of view, seriously, I think id fans are going to hate me for this, but Rage had the most unmemorable story of any game they did. I think. Wolfenstein had... Or Wolfenstein the New Order has probably the best written, most memorable story. I don't want to say most memorable out of all their games, but right now, because it's still fresh in my mind, it is. But it's definitely one of the most well-written stories ever in id's library right now so definitely this is a must get game i mean uh, it i'm surprised i'm saying that i'm really in awe of myself for saying yes you need to get this game but it is really really fucking awesome really good and if I'm only mentioning two bad points and both of them are pretty minor and one of them may just have been me, that should tell you something. That Honestly. But, uh, I will warn people that there is, um, a lot of strong violence. If you have any gore triggers, one probably aren't playing first-person shooter, but this is some... This has at least one scene that made me squirm towards the end of the game. It, it does get hard to watch. But I think a lot of it also has to do with the emotional impact these characters have. And it just credits to what the writing does. So, basically, as a number grade, I'd give this an 8.5 slash 9 out of 10. Uh, the only reason I'm saying 8.5 slash 9 is because I'm really on the fence with the gameplay thing. If it ends up that it was just me sucking at those parts, it's a 9. But if it's... Re well, except, again, the armored soldiers with shotguns and rockets, they are overpowered, but I'm still... Let's call it an 8.75. Fuck it. Now, that ends the spoiler-free section of this review, because the next one goes into... Kind of a bizarre theory I have, and this is a discussion I want to have with people who've played the game. So, 
If you don't want anything spoiled for you, any theory spoiled for you, just stop the video here, and I'll see you next time. Otherwise, stay tuned. I'll give you guys a few seconds. Ow. That could have been a bit more graceful, couldn't it? Okay. Anyone who wants to stop, stopped, right? Okay, good. Now, this is the section of this video I'm going to call BJ Blazkowicz is Dead. It sounds like an odd title, right? But there's a few good points in this that make me wonder if the end of... or if this game even happened. Um... So we, oh no, after the first level, BJ's left pretty much dead in the water, in the ocean, with shrapnel in his brain after an explosion on a failed mission. Fourteen years in a mental institution, and he has all of his strength back? Now, I know I mentioned earlier that this game's really not meant to be purely realistic, but... There's things in this game that make me wonder if he's even alive. And I'll get to the biggest one last, even though I want to talk about that now. But um, some of it includes, like, towards the end of the game, Booby stabs him with a knife, injects him with a poison, and he even mentions as BJ's getting up to kill him, I injected you with enough to stop an elephant. And BJ's fine. He wakes up from his 14-year-old or 14-year catatonic state, almost at full strength. Just mentioning, my fingers are numb and my legs feel like jelly. But he's still moving like he's in the midst of battle and able to do it. He's able to drive, only losing consciousness just before running over a or going under a bridge and running over a Nazi. He's able to retain most of his memories without any brain damage. He's able to fight these Nazis at full capacity. He's not handicapped in any way. In fact, in some regards, he comes back stronger than ever. Even in a really highly fictionalized setting, that seems preposterous. But you also have... Parts where he's in the prison trying to save the uh, or save Set Roth. He gets stabbed multiple times, put in a chair, stabbed or slashed again. But he's able to escape with no problem, no wounds whatsoever. He's um able to escape the prison, riding on the back of his robot without getting hurt. And he's in a very open position on this robot. He's... Do you see the weird thing here? I mean, yeah, it's a first-person shooter where the main character is kind of a Superman, but... He should be... Not dead ten times over, but not invincible. In fact, the only time he really shows any sign of injuries at the end of the game... Again, spoiler alert here. When he ki or Death Head's, uh, Death's Head kills himself with a grenade while BJ st or stabs him. That's the only time he's hurt. Now, here's my theory. As I've kind of hinted at, I chose the Fergus timeline as my first playthrough. Mainly because I kind of think Wyatt is a really bland character, but that might change. And Fergus is... Fergus is awesome, okay? I, I, I'm... I feel sorry for Fergus, but he's an awesome character. Well, Fergus's timeline has Tekla, the insane mathematician. And I didn't think she was going to be anything important. 
I figured, okay, she's just a character that's rambling on about math. I should have known better. I really should have known better. After the missions and you go to the Chrysal Circle, you can take naps in the bed. Third time you do this, you wake up next to Anya, and there's Tekla sitting at the bed staring at you too. Kind of creepy. And she starts talking about why she never sleeps. Why she's losing... Co or her theory basically amounts to... Damn it, my nose is itchy. No, that's not her theory. Um, basically, it amounts to... When you lose consciousness, you die. Your body stays alive, but you effectively, as a person, dies. But... Another person takes over your body, and even or since it's the same body, same mind, retains the same memories, but is effectively a different person. And then she tells BJ, you already have been out for four, at least 14 years. You have shrapnel in your brain, and you're brain damaged. How do we know you're not dead, and this is all in your imagination? Basically, right there, throws a hint that, yeah... You're dead. This isn't happening. This is all fake. This is the last hurrah for you, and it's all imagined as you're dying. If you listen closely to what she points out, it makes complete sense. I mean, it's not even just that BJ is able to survive some of these things, but the transition from train to hotel room being that smooth, like, it just, there's Anya standing half naked at the window, all of a sudden, she's wearing clothes, you're in a completely di ro different room completely, but you're both in the same position where you're lying in the bed, and she's at the window. Because you were never on the train. You were never in the hotel. You're still in the ocean, lying on a board, dying. The woman in the beginning of the game where BJ is saying how he want, wanted to have a normal life, but that's not for him, is Anya. It's the woman he's fantasized about since the beginning of the game. And then he's fantasizing about her being the warrior. Or not warrior, but kind of the liberty figure. It's his fantasy. It's basically him, one, admitting that he can't have a normal life, and two, imagining how he could be happy in the life he's in now. Because he's talking about the atrocities of war, how many soldiers and children, or as he says, kids that um, Death's Head is murdered. He watches some of his friends die right in front of him one in a particularly gruesome fashion and then sir er, jumps out of the castle window getting shrapnel in his brain landing face first in the water how is he surviving i think the very end of the game where he says nuke the castle is literally him saying okay i won even if it's in my, even if it's just in his mind he finally won that's my thought on it i uh, i want to develop that a bit more and go more depth on it but th that's seriously what i'm thinking is that this game never really happened and the thing is, if that's true, I'm not upset because it's still it's still a hell, hell of a fun ride. But that's all I got on that right now. I'll probably come back to it at some point in time. But next time I see you guys will probably be either Watch Dogs or Murdered. But you guys will find out probably when I do. Alright, I'll see you guys later.